Okay, we're live. We're, we're recording now. Okay, so here we go. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we are oh. going to get going. Here we go. Everybody sees that? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Great. I'm going to try and see as many of you as I can while I'm sharing my screen, which is not always easy, but we do. Okay, now. <sighs> This again. This is this is straight straight out of the book I mentioned last week, right out of uh, Rabbi Foreman, and um, I think that um, oh my god, bigger. And what? There we go. You see that? It's nice and big. Okay. So what I what I want to what I want to share with you is what what he does. It's it, this is just a small section of his book. Again, the book um, which uh, Miriam Y already ordered this book is the Esther that you thought you knew, okay? It's already the title is just like very, you know, scintillating, like, oh, I thought I knew something about Esther, okay? So the, 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 the starting, and this is part of, again, of a larger section, but if I had to ask you the basic question, why, what's the name of the holiday and why is it called that name? Maybe that could be one of the trivia questions for the youth department, there are only three left, I think, I don't know. So anybody, like, uh, let's hear it. I know your feet's going to answer first. So I'm just going to call on you, your feet. Pur is a lot. And Haman casts lots to see which day to kill the Jews. Okay, that's a lot to take in. Is it? You saw what I did there? A lot. Yes. You got it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, uh, so the the... Okay, so, and, and this is like kind of how Rabbi Foreman always does it. Like, okay, if you're picking the, if you had to pick the name of the holiday, would you pick the name of the device used to pick a time to exterminate a certain people and then we were saved from it? No. Right? So it's a little weird. Right? It's, a, you know, it, it's a little odd that that's the name. Oh, Purim, you know? Okay. So, we're going to start here in the ninth chapter because, I mean, who doesn't start in the ninth chapter? It's also very important because by the time we get to the ninth chapter in the Megillah, it's like ha Esther already revealed herself and Haman's already killed and they, they already did the one breath, you know, we did all that. And the rest is like cleaning up the mess. And it seems so repetitive, and they're going to give Mishloch Monos, and they give Matan Zavion, and they did this, and they did Medina Medina. It's like, all right, you know, everybody's already looking at the watch. I'm hungry. I haven't eaten yet. I've been fasting all day. Can we just get to it already? I got it. Story over. I don't need the rest of this. Okay. So let's let's like be done with it. Okay. That and I'm speaking about myself, obviously, but I think other people have shared this feeling in the past uh, with the Megillah. Okay. So Mordechai writes down, this is the beginning of the chapter. I have it in English as well, if you want to read the English. And I actually did a side-by-side -side comparison on the sheet, as we'll see in a minute, because it's going to be really, really important. So Mordechai writes down these words, and he sends books to all uh, uh, of, the, of the provinces. They should make the 14th of Adar and the 15th of Adar every single year, just the way the Jews that they finished uh, from, from their battle and things were turned. Everything turned around, turned about as fair play, and they sent gifts and they gave gifts to the poor. And the, everybody, and verse 23, and the Jews accepted whatever was began and whatever Mordechai commanded. And then the, the Megillah goes into like a little interlude here. Well, by the way, you want to know why it's called Purim? Let me explain to you why. Why? Because Haman, the son of Hamdata, the Agagite, the tormentor of all the Jews, he wanted to destroy all the Jews. Like Yafit said, and he cast a lot, which is a lot. He peeled poor who are garo. I'm having trouble hearing you. Okay, Siri, I wasn't talking to you. Be quiet. I hate it when Siri does that. Um, so he cast a lot, Abdam, to destroy them. And when she came, who's when she came? Esther. And when Esther came in front of the king and she said, Listen, um, you know, you need to, um, you, 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 you have these letters of, 
that you commanded of 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 his evil thoughts, Asher Chashav Yudim Al Rosho, which he thought on on the Jew the Jews, Vitalu Al Sovets Panav Al Eitz, Al Kain Karuli Amim Ha'ele Purim Al Shem Apur. Therefore, we call these days Purim because of the poor. Al Kain Al Kol Divrei Ha'Igeres Hazos, and because of this whole letter, Omar Al Kacham Magi Alehem. Okay, fine. So the Megillah tells us straight out that the reason is why is it called Purim? Can somebody just translate this for me literally? I mean, you can look at the uh, look at the at the verses down, down the bottom. Okay, um, for Haman, right? But when he had cast a poor, that is the lot with intent to crush. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded with the promulgation of this decree. I'm not sure what happened there. Why did I go there? Um, my uh, my my my. Oh, maybe I should go like this. Um, okay, the evil plot which he devised against the Jews recoil on his own head, so they impaled him and his sons on the stake. For that reason, these days were named Purim, after Pur. So the, the Megillah clearly says that it's called Purim because of the lots. However, if you were writing this verse, and if let's say we accept that as a given, that Purim is called Purim because he cast lots, you would write the Pesukim differently. You would write, because Haman, the tormentor of all the Jews, he wanted to destroy them. And he cast lots to destroy them. Then you would say, So when you say, therefore, therefore usually refers to what immediately proceeds in the Pasuk. What's immediately found right before. Which would mean that the reason why we call it Purim, is not because of the Pasuk Chavdal, but because of Pasuk Chav Hey. It's called Purim, why? Because because when Esther came in front of the king, and she said to talk about his terrible thoughts that he had of them, and then somehow it got reversed or changed or whatever fair it turned about, and he was hanged on the tree. So then the question is, is why does the Megillah write this out of order? Or maybe there's a deeper message, which, by the way, guess which we're going to pick. There's a deeper message here that the reason it's called Purim is not just because he cast lots, because that would be all too convenient. It also doesn't make a lot of sense. But there's a lot more that's at stake here. There's a lot more that's happening that it, the, the, the McGill is trying to tell us about what's really happening. So we have to go now to uh, perhaps a, a, an important verse, which we're going to see in a second here. Um, let's go to this verse. Um, I don't know why this is doing like that. Oh, my thing. Oh, my screen. Oh, my screen. Here we go. Okay. Here, you see this verse now. Yodalit, is everybody with me? Thumbs up? Yeah. You see it? Okay. So in, in, this is, of course, the, what we call the, 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 the seminal pasuk, the seminal verse of, of the Megillah where Mordechai approaches Esther, they they, there's a decree against them, and there is a uh, terrible plot against them. And Mordechai sends message, and he says to her, Okay, so Mordechai says, if you keep silent during this crisis, Relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another place while you and your father's house will perish. And who knows, perhaps you have attained to royal position for just such a crisis. So can somebody tell that to me in plain English? What does that mean? Otherwise, I'm going to have to call on your feet. Or worse, I'm going to call on Vivian. <laughs> Go to your feet. <laughs> I mean, we discussed this last week that the Megillah is about Esther seizing her moment in time, her moment in history. And that's the message that's sent to us, that we have to see what our place is and what our calling is. And But we talked about it last week, so I don't know. Correct, correct. That's, and that's exactly what it means. But if we read the Pesukim carefully, he says, if you are silent, then Revach Vahatzalah, if you remember in Parashas Vayishlach, we discussed Revach Vahatzalah, okay? But he says, Revach Vahatzalah, Yamalim Kamachar. In other words, the Jews are gonna be fine, Esther. Like, God will save us. Well, you know, he doesn't mention God, as we discussed last week. He's like, the Revach, the Hatzalah, will come from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, we'll be fine. However, at ubeis avich tovedu, you 
and your father's house will perish. Now, what does that mean? That so, so if she does, in other words, if she does nothing, what's going to happen? The Pasuk tells us she will die. Everybody else will be fine. Mordechai knows this somehow. Okay. You and your father's house. First of all, what does that, what does that mean? Your father's house. Your, her, who's her father? What does it mean? Her father's house. It's her line. It's her her it, her entire genetic line would be. Usually, we go down. We don't go up. Right. Okay. And what genetics? She doesn't have any kids. You know. Um, and even if she does have kids, which she does have kids, you know, I don't think these are the kind of kids that the the mishpacha is proud of necessarily. <laughs> you know. My, you know, you met my son-in-law, Hashverish. Oh boy, can he drink? Um, you know, <laughs> so uh, you know, it wasn't exactly they didn't uh, they didn't put it on OnlySimchas.com. So um, what? What? Uh, and so, so what? So what? Why? Why can't Esther? Like at the like he says, if if you remain silent, so just be quiet. Like if she is silent, like why can't she just do nothing? So here, what we're hap- what's going to happen here is we're going to see that what Mordechai is doing, he's actually echoing words that are found earlier in the Chumash in Tanakh, and he's almost saying it verbatim. And we have seven, seven items, which I'll read off to you, which then we'll look in the text, seven items which produce similarities between these two topics. So first of all, um, if you look at the next source, the, the word that's constantly used here to describe Esther and all the people that are going for this beauty contest is all na'ara. Na'ara, ta'na'ara, ha'na'ara, na'arateha. The word na'ara appears like a zillion times in the Megillah. We're talking about a na'ara. And, and anything I mention now is going to be found in the earlier portion in the Chumash as well. A na'ara, also talking about someone who is married, number two. It talks about a relationship that one has with a spouse. It talks about base aviha, somebody, a, a, a married girl or is in her father's house. Silence, remaining silent is very prescient in the story. And it has to be done in a very, like if you don't hurry now, the window is closing, it has to be a short window of time. And the last thing is this, this language of, and the key here is hacharesh tacharishi. Now, if I would ask you, and if you would ask me, by the way, to guess, if you gave me those seven items and you told me, where else in Tanakh do we have such a story? I'd be scratching my head for like four hours and I wouldn't figure it out, even though it's something that's right smack in front of your face, okay? So let's look at this psukim in Bamidbar, which is absolutely unbelievable. This is ma- beginning of Parshas Matos. Beginning of Parshas Matos is the 30th chapter of Bamidbar and it has to do with really exciting topic of laws of vows. Really, really very, I mean, this is scintillating. If somebody makes a vow and they don't keep it and I nullify it and I don't keep it and I like it, I don't like it, what do I do? Ba, 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 ba. Okay, so what happens uh, in those cases? And this is also, it's a summer parsha. We're like half on vacation. We're not really paying attention. It's the three weeks. It always falls during the three weeks because Matos uh, uh, is sometimes together with Mase, but it's usually definitely within the three weeks. It's in the three uh, sad haftoras that we read. So let's look at this, this Parsha as a, as a unit, and then you're going to see them side by side, and you're going to see exactly what he's talking about. So it says, if a person makes a neder to God, okay, if, and, and, and he puts it. So what is a neder? By the way? Everybody, let, let me go back, because I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe not everybody realizes what a neder is. A neder is a vow. A neder is a fascinating area of halacha because you can actually create sort of new law for yourself, new new Torah for yourself. So for instance, okay, if a person makes a neder, that's why when Jews talk, we always say, are you coming over? Bli neder. Bli neder. Bli neder. Why? Because what you say is binding on your behavior. So if a person would say, the person says, person X, Reuven says, Reuven makes a ned there that Reuven will not eat meat for 30 days. And he says it and he means it. So for Reuven, to him, if he would eat a piece of meat, it would be just as bad if he was eating pork. It would be just as bad as if eating basar bechal of milk and meat together. It would be just as bad as if he was wearing shatnas. In other words, to him, 
Not only to Ruvain, but because he expressed this vow, that's the power of a neder, is that he now has created a new category of iser, a new category of prohibition upon himself, and it is 100% binding. Okay, that's that's how uh, that's how a nader works. Okay, so does that count for a diet? Absolutely. Okay. Um, that's 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 like that, that's like the it's like the the root of all dieting. <laughs> okay. Is it only in prohibition? Uh, no, also to do something as well. Okay. Like a person, if you if you, that's what we, when we say like oh a person's going to give tzedakah, we say bli neder. We always say that in Yisker. Right, Yisker, right. correct. Right, right, right. Et cetera, et Fine. That's exactly the same idea. So here's the case here. So if a pers if a person makes a neder or he makes a, a neder and a shvul, that's for, for right now, uh, we'll call it the same thing. Okay. And he makes an isar on himself, he makes an obligation on himself. Okay. Um, he cannot. He has to keep what he said. He has to do whatever he says. If a woman makes a nether, and she makes an obligation, she makes a vow while she's still in her father's house. And her father hears her nether, and he hears what she prevent, what she what she uh, uh, accepted on herself. And whatever, whatever he, whatever she says has to stand. However, verse six tells us, the father has the right to, to nullify and say, I don't want to keep her. I don't like her vow. I can undo her vow. Let's say she's married and she makes such an ed there. And her father, and it says, Now, by the way, this is important. Isha with a yud and a mapike doesn't mean woman, it means haish shela, which means if, if her husband, which means her husband, which is when the Balkriya, when you read it, they say like very emphatically, Vishamai shok, like a mapeke is like, oh, like as if you have something caught in your throat. So if Vishamai Sha Biyom Shama of the if the husband hears on um in verse eight, if he hears any and and, and and if he hears on on that day, the hecherishla. And he's silent about it. Then that whatever she says remains in force. However, verse nine, yani osa. If let's say the day that he hears what's going on, and then he rejects and he objects to it, the hefer esnidra asher and then he can nullify the 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 vow which she has accepted upon himself, etc., 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 and Hashem islachla. It keeps going on and on. And the im uh look at 13, Yod Gimel Vim Haferi Afer Osam Isha Biyom Shamo Komotswas Vasel and the Reli Zana Michal Yakum, Isha Ferim Vashem Islachla. And if the husband doesn't know them and has to be on the day that he finds out, then nothing that she says will stand and he has annulled it. Call Ned Rechol Shivas Isar Lit Anos Nafesh, Isha Yikimenov Isha Yifarenu. Any Nader, any vow. That will cause hardship, litanos, like we said, by 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 the Mitzrayim. Anything that causes um, uh, um, any sort of uh, deprivation or any difficulty, the husband can either uphold it or he can nullify it. However, if the ha- if it if a day passes and the husband does nothing, then vehekim es kol nidareha. Then he has to. Then all her vows stay. However, if if he's quiet and then he wants to, to nullify it, he accepts all the uh, responsibilities. So what's the, what's the basic gist here? Is that if a husband wants to nullify his wife's vows that are going to cause difficulty either for her or for him or for them, he has one day to do so, okay? So what do you have here in this parsha? You have na'ara, you have someone who's dealing with marriage, you have someone, the base of viha, you have someone who is silent if they do if if they do something. And by the way, look at verse te- fifteen. Hacharish yacharish is the only other time we have the double instance of im hacharish tacharish boes hazos in the Megillah. And here we have in Bamidbar hacharish tacharish. It's the only time we have those two words together. Okay. And then also 
He says, if you don't do it now, Mordechai says, we're going to lose out. What happens here? How much time do you have? One day is one day to act. Okay. And then they have this double language. Now, what is the, let, let's look at this hacharish tacharish for a second. Okay. What does that mean to be hacharish tacharish? What does that mean? What does la hacharish mean? Silent. So it's like, so, so how, if I say in, 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 yeah, fee, let's say the, the time's going to come, we're going to be able to travel to Israel, okay? And then you're going to go to Rishon and Lezion, uh, <laughs> to your cousins, right? And it's going to be like a chavaya, and you're going to be like singing and dancing, right? And then you want to talk to your cousins, and all the little kids are running around, and you want to yell at the kids in Hebrew, like, just to be quiet for a second, so that you could talk to your cousins, right? What are you going to say to those kids in Hebrew? Right. Also comes from deafness. Oh, 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 oh. Right. So, shtok is quiet, but also like biblically speaking, like when things are calm, like sheket, like we have in Yona when the sea, like to, to quiet the sea. Hacharesh only applies to human beings. Like, by, like Shelley said correctly, a cheresh is someone who is uh, is deaf or deaf mute or someone who at the same time, let, let, let's put this, let's every, every Jewish husband, okay? Okay, we have tricks. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna explain to you some of the tricks. We pretend like we don't hear you. I said this to my, my father was an like expert at it. Like when he was in the nursing home, he pretended so much like my, my you know, that, that he couldn't hear, he heard everything. He was just being like, like playing games because that's what we do. We, we practice 40, 50, 60 years of marriage doing this, okay? Or the other trick that we have is that you send us to the supermarket, we intentionally get it wrong so that you'll never send us again. I'm just telling you, that's like a move, okay? Because we're like, oh, you want to, you know, a dafka get like the, the worst kind of eggs or the worst vegetable, or like, you know, when you, they say, go get lettuce and you go to the thing in Chapra and there's like 972 different types of lettuce. So what do I do? So I get the worst possible one. Okay, that, that's, that's our trick. Okay, I'm giving you trade secrets. So la is, to be silent, but almost to like ignore it, to pretend I can't hear it. To pretend I can't hear it. Now, what happens, the Torah is telling us, if you pretend that you can't hear something. Now, it's not like there's an in-between here. A lot of people, they discuss this when they talk about you know faith in God, like either you believe in God or you don't believe in God. There's no in-between. And with a lot of decisions, there's no choice C of like maybe. It's either you do it or you don't. But if you pretend not to hear it, or if you're passive, if you're completely inactive, if you're a cheresh in the sense of, I'm doing nothing, I didn't hear anything, then guess what? The results that will follow through are going to happen because you didn't do anything. Your passivity is also a decision. Your lack of, of, of concrete action also speaks volumes about where you stand on the matter, which is why the Torah says that if, if after a day and he's silent, meaning he heard what she did, he knows the vow that she took, but he didn't want to say anything. He's like, ah, you know, he's tongue tied or he doesn't know what to do. He's scared or he doesn't want to act. Then guess what? You have accepted what she has done. And therefore, whatever consequences may come, you have to bear. Okay, because it says, Then it, it, whatever she says or whatever she forbids is going to stand. They will stand. Why? Oh, for you did not protest. You did not say anything differently. Therefore, it will stand. Okay, now you can already see where we're going with this is. Look at the, 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 the functional words here. Um, let me put it to you this way. Let me, let, me, let me show you this page, which is a lot cooler. Okay, what I did here is a little side by side. Okay, we have Bamidbar on one side and we have Esther on the other side. You see it? Now, I also conveniently color coded it because look at the functional words between and, and just look at the number of comparisons, look at the functional words between these two types of paragraphs here, seemingly disparate topics, entirely unrelated, making vows and Esther, okay? And let's see how we could read one into the other. By the way, the yellow that you see, that's the Hacharesh and Benurev, which of course we have uh, in, in a different part of the Megillah, but specifically this chapter, 
what's the what's the the if, if we start in Esther and we ask what is the nature of the word Purim? So you're gonna say, oh, because he cast lots. But if we look at it in this light, first of all, look at how many times the word Purim appears in chapter nine. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or you can count this as one heapil pur. So seven times. Now, what's the root? What's the root of the word pur? We say lot. Okay. But if I take you, let's go back a few years to the Sefer of the Radak, of David Kimchi, who was one of the great Rishonim interpreting of, of uh, etymology of words in the Bible. And here in his entry on the word pur, he says, what's the word? He feel esprisi hefar, mefer, lo hafeira, all the things that deal with nullification. The root of the word pur is not lot, but it's nullification. And look what he says at the bottom. He peel poor hu ha gorol. He says he peel poor gorol is the same thing has to do with nullification. So using this aruch, I mean, sorry, this this radak. <laughs> let's go back, okay? So if I say, what is the reason why it's called purim? Well, maybe it has to do something with hafer with nullification. So now, now that we have this springboard, what nullification? How would that relate? How could it possibly relate nullification of a vow to the story of Esther? And this is where it gets a little bit fancy, but but you'll you'll get yourself in the right direction. You'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. So anybody want to take a jump at it, or else I'm going to call on Mary. He was nullifying a people. He was correct, but let's say particularly from the point of view of Esther. Remember, remember original question. We said it's called Esther. It's called Purim because of what Esther did to the king, right? Now, one thing, one thing that you'll notice in the story, and this is what also gets lost, and it's a weird thing in the story. What happens in the story of Purim? First of all, when does Esther cry in front of the king? Not the first time she goes to see him, when she invites him to a party. Not at the party with Haman when she reveals himself and says he wants to kill us. It's later on when she approaches after everything is done. And if you look carefully in the story, what does she ask? What does she ask when she cries? She's because because first of all, okay, she reveals her true identity. The king is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And what does he do? He gets rid of Haman. Now, why he gets rid of Haman, that's a whole other sheer, whole other class, okay? But he gets rid of Haman. Now, what happens with the decree that Haman put into action? Now, it would make sense where the king. She goes to the king and she says, and this is when she goes the second time and he extends the Shavit HaZahav and she, she takes her life, she risks her life, okay? And he says, um, listen, um, what is it that you want? And you know, he doesn't say like, he's not as, as, as magnanimous as the first time around with the half the kingdom and all that. He's like, hey, what do you want? Okay, and what does she say? She's like, well, you know, there are these, there are these decrees to kill, exterminate my people, you know, they're still in effect, even though the bad guy's gone, but the decree is still there. So what does he say? What does she say? Can, you know, can we, what can we do about it? And he basically says, no. yeah, I'm sorry. There's nothing I could do because like once it's out there, it's out there. So what do they have to do? So what's the solution? They fight. They issue a new decree. Oh, yeah, correct. You're both right. Um, first, Vivian, say that again. They issue a new decree. They issue a new decree and much of these three chapters at the end are about that new decree and why they have sort of efficacy. Why? Because you think about it, if you're, if you're living in, in, in uh, India, okay, and you know that Hashverish is the king and you got this very important decree to kill Jews on the 14th of Adar, and then you get another decree that says, yeah, don't kill Jews on Adar. It doesn't say don't kill, it says, you know, Jews can kill you. Like, which one are you going to take seriously? So they do everything in their power to make sure that the second decree is has efficacy, okay? Because what can't Esther do? What can she not do? She can't nullify she, what has been. Correct. Through. She cannot nullify what is already out there. However, what can she do? She can make a newer, better, really much cooler type of decree. And that's found what? Look at the word, the other word, the other functional word that appears so many times in the green. Lekayem alayhem. Kimu vikiblu. Lekayem, lekayem, lekayem. Kimu, kimu. And what here, what appears in the story in Bamidbar? 
Vikamu lo yakum, yakumu vikamu, yakum, vikum, vikum, right? You see what's happening here. Vikamu means to uphold, to fulfill. What she does, and by the way, the last instance we have, it, it's, it's in the same Pasuk, right? Yishayi um, Kimeno, Yishayi Fereno, right? Kiem Divrei Hapurim, like the same time they appear, the same Pasuk. Umamar Estar Kiem Divrei Hapurim. What does that mean, Divrei? So, 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 what is, so, so if we go back and using this lens, what is Mordechai telling her, okay? He's saying like this, and it's a, pl- it's a great play on the words, okay? What happens if someone's spouse makes a vow and the spouse finds out and does nothing about it? Then what's going to happen? Whatever, whatever, this, whatever the vow was made is going to stand. Okay. However, what happens if it's if the husband hears and he's silent, then it will land, then it will stand. But what if you read Isha as Isha as the wife? A great play on words, Vishama Isha. What if the wife hears? He's, Mordechai is telling her, hey, you remember that, that sugi about vows? What happens if the wife hears and does nothing? What's going to happen? It's going to stand. It's going to be upheld, whatever he said. So therefore, he says to her just the same language because we have in 15, if he is silent, then Hekim is called the He's saying to her, Esther, if you're silent, about what your husband is doing, then what's going to happen? It's going to be fulfilled. Therefore, v'at ubeit avicha tovedo. He says, therefore, you and your father's house will be lost. What do you mean? I'm talking about the sugya of nurea beis aviha. You are nara beis aviha. That's what I'm referring to. What Mordechai said it's a great play on words. So he's saying to her, Esther, you have to act. You have to do something right now. And she indeed is the heroine. Why? Because she acts. She's not silent. If she was silent, that would mean that she's complicit. And he said, you know what? God will save us some other way. But Esther, you're done. Because it's as if you are, you're going to have to suffer the brunt of the vow that your husband made, the decree that he made, because it's on you for not saying anything. However, you have to say something. So what does she do? She does say something. And what does she do? She cannot nullify it. She cannot do Purim on it. But what you can do is she can do Kimu Vakiblu. She can do Lekayim. She can do something to fulfill, to make a new vow, a new decree that will be upheld. And in fact, that's actually what happened. So if we go back, if we go back to the original, original question that we had, when we, we, we were talking about, let me just do it on the top page, it's a little bit bigger. Verse 24, why is it called Purim? Because Haman, yes, he peeled poor. Yes, yeah, so there's a double meaning here. He did cast lots, but those got turned on his head. And when she came in front of the king, in other words, when she risked her life a second time, when she was not silent, when she acted immediately, when she acted with alacrity, when she acted with, with purpose, and she said, what about the safer? That what about what about the 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 the, the decree that uh, that Haman made against us? Right? What are we going to do about that? Right? What is the translation? Um, when Esther came before the king, he commanded with the promulgation of this decree, let the evil plot which was devised against the Jews recoil on his own head. So they, you know, she said, what about, what about, why can't we reverse? She did something. Why can't we reverse this? Why can't we do something about this thing? And then they hanged him. Mm-hmm. This is why it's called Purim. It's called Purim because not only the Vlat, of course, that he made, but also that Esther, she did the best that she could fair, to nullify, to abrogate, to, to Purim this, this, this decree against them. And when that was unable to be done, because he said it's the king's decree, she found plan B, which is L'chayim. She did something to fulfill. So what you have here really something, uh, uh, I think it's so beautiful when you have to look at the intertextuality of, of the Bible in Tanakh. Um, and it's something that cannot, if it's one thing to, when you have so many comparisons, and again, I, I'm, I'm just giving you sort of like the, the, the skimming the top here of what's really happening. Uh, but when you think about it and ask the original question, it doesn't make sense to call the holiday Purim 
just because we're going to think about the device that our enemy used to determine the day that he wanted to destroy us. It's not a very logical name for a holiday. All of our holidays are about, you know, Zaman Cheruseinu, oh, it's the time of our freedom. Oh, this is uh, uh, Hanukkah, right? Oh, we talk about the victory of the Maccabees, the, the Rabbi Miyad Atim. And we talk about Shavuos, the time of giving of the Torah. And <laughs> so we dwelled in Hatim. Here, Purim, oh, because a guy tried to kill us and he used a, you know, uh, 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 you know he, he played the rock, scissor, paper. Okay? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit. If you had to name the holiday, we'd call it, oh, the victory of Esther, victory of Mordechai, Jewish power, I, whatever you want to call it. But here, the, the Megillah very cleverly buries it in one pasuk. Al Kain Karuli on Purim. Why? Because of what happened before when Esther, she was bold. Mordechai said, "You have to act now." Just like in the case of the vow, you don't have time. You don't have a day to waste to think about it. If you're complicit, if you're hacharish tacharishi, like the husband with the vows, then guess what? You're going to be suffering the same fate, and it's going to be all your fault. It's going to be on your head. Cheto you saw, you're going to have to carry the, the the sin. Instead, she acted. She did what she could. She couldn't nullify it, which is Purim, but she found another way, which is through the word lakayim. It's absolutely beautiful. It's fascinating when you see something like this and you say like, I cannot believe I've seen this for so many years. It's been right in front of my face and it wasn't there and I didn't, I didn't get it. There's a lot more to be said, but again, read, I, please, please read the, this. None of this is mine. It's all, it's all Rabbi Foreman. It's phenomenal in the book. It's just a short chapter towards the end of the book, but it, you have to read the other portions to build up to it. Uh, but I was able to give you sort of this excerpt because I wanted to be excited about something about Purim that's coming up to think, and, and, and it's a good question. Like if you're sitting at the shop, shop it says Purim. You're sitting at the Shabbos table and ask people, like, why is the holiday called Purim? And does it really make any sense? Um, and by the way, if you want to take it a little further, if you want to get a little Kabbalistic, we know that the Chazal teach us, and there are many, many comparisons. They say that Yom Kippur, it's called what? Yom Kippurim. It's a day like Purim. So there are lots of answers. Why, on Yom Kippur, there's lots. You know, they had the Sa'ir La Hashem, the Sa'ir La Zazel. We had the, the two animals and they would cast lots. And this one would be atoning for the sins and being thrown off the cliff. And this one would be brought as the carbon, et cetera. Okay. But also, what's the first thing that we do on, on, on Yom Kippur? To uh, nullify our vows. Correct. We say Kol Nidre. We say Kol Nidre. Maybe this is another hint of Yom Kippurim. The day like Purim is that Purim is about nullification. It's about undoing what was happening to us. Or we start, I mean, that's another question. Why would we start, why start um, Yom Kippur with Kol Nidre? You know, we've had, we've had this conversation before. And, and I, I think the basic reason is, and there are many reasons, but is, you know, it, it, we are given the power of speech. And which probably is the main source of, getting, of our getting into trouble. And before we can ask for forgiveness or ask for atonement, we have to recognize that we have the power of speech and that we have abused it. And therefore we have to disabuse ourselves of anything that we may have done wrong via speech, which is nullification of the vows. I guarantee you that if anybody here was writing the Yom Kippur liturgy and you had to start off, nobody would start off with Kal Nidre. You know, you might start off with a little Alvina Makenu, you might start off with a little buttering up, you might start off with a little al Khaid action, I don't know, but nobody's picking a, a Kal Nidre. Now we know it. it's so like the, the, the melody, it's so haunting, it's beautiful, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately speaking, um, Kol Nidre is not in here, but maybe this helps us by saying Yom Kippurim. It's about nullification. So ask, why is a holiday called Purim? Oh, because Esther risked everything by not staying silent and by trying to nullify that which her husband did. She couldn't actually nullify it, but she found a way to, super, to, to, to overtake it right, to uh, supersede what he had already decreed. She made a better decree, because the best way to have a decree, make a better one, right? That's why people like don't buy computers, because the second you buy it, it's outdated. There's always a better one, okay? There's a certain like time you have to decide like, okay, I'm, I'm getting this, I'm sticking with it, okay? Um, she found a way to do it, and that's the meaning, and that's why these end chapters are so important. So when we're getting hungry and the stomach, stomach is growling at the end over here, think to yourselves, like, this is all the meaning right here, and it brings us all, all together. So um, I, I think, um, I hope everybody has a, has a, has a, great, uh, a great Purim. Um, I, I, you know, 
I hope you're, I was very excited about this. You know, I can't, I'm going to share it again, even on Shabbos with the, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with the guys in Shul, because I think it's really, really cool, especially when you see it side by side. So take some time, look at those sheets, especially the, the side by side comparison, and then you'll see exactly how they line up and, 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 and how the words really make so much sense. Um, and this is also about Isha and Isha. That you know what the the the, the real story why, and maybe this is why it's called Megillas Esther even though it's just as much Mordechai it's Megillas Esther because she's the one that puts everything into action and by doing so she accomplishes real Purim not Mordechai she accomplishes Purim because of what she does and she avoids having at ubeis avich tovedu which is only found beis avicha niureha etc in Bamidbar and this is found here so again hope everybody has a wonderful Freilich and Purim I thank you so much for accommodating uh, uh, the earlier hour because we have a Levaya this morning but um, we should have Simchas and again wish everybody Freilich and Purim and uh, we will uh, God willing continue you know with you know what coming up after Purim but I can't <laughs> say it thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you very much